the history of Western philosophy begins in that area of the world which I hope you recognize as the Aegean Sea with Greece and uh, Asia Minor. Um, the first known philosopher who's talked about at least um, Thales of Miletus um, came from just about that location in the center of the west coast of the Asia Minor Peninsula. In other words, the Greek colonies scattered around the Aegean. Now, um, a question that one usually starts with is how do you account then for the rise of Western philosophy? There in the Aegean area in ancient Greece. And um, there are several lines of explanation uh, which are important. One is, of course, that it stands at the crossroads between East and West, where traditional ideas would be challenged by the interaction with Eastern culture, uh, simply because of the way in which the trade routes came uh, through Asia Minor and um, down the uh, Meander Valley, the river Meander meanders down to the sea, so this is the Meander Valley there, and the trade routes come that way. Uh, so, all right, uh, cross-cultural stimulation led to the asking of some basic questions. Um, a second thing that is emphasized a great deal, and I think appropriately, is that the early Greek philosophers were really um, pre-scientific scientists. They were asking questions about the natural world, about the natural order, about the natural processes. Uh, they raise questions about basic elements. What basic element or elements underlie all of the rich furniture of the heavens and the earth that we see? What are the causal processes that account for the variation of things and the changes that occur? Uh, that sort of question. Um, early philosophy of nature, primitive cosmology, Questions about the origin of the cosmos as we know it began to arise. And you could see how they could be connected with the differences between East and West and the stimulation that comes with the mythology of the two interacting and coming into some degree of conflict. But there is a third feature that is tremendously important. And I think, um, I've come to think increasingly, um, a particular importance. Uh, the earlier Greek poets, dramatists, uh, had the conviction that the cosmic order, which we observe in nature, is also a moral order, a notion of cosmic justice is something that surfaces among some of those early literary figures. Uh, in between the Odyssey and the Iliad, it begins to appear. In Hesiod, it's explicit. In Aeschylus and Sophocles, it's present. So that the question is whether there is an order to the cosmos that includes a moral order. If this is a moral universe, how do we explain that fact? So then, we have really two philosophical lines of thought in accounting for the origin of Greek philosophy here. One that focuses simply 
on uh, reflection about the physical cosmos and the other about reflection on the moral order which they believed to exist in the processes of nature. So what I want to do today is to focus on the first of these, their attention to the physical order, and then next time to turn our attention to the moral order. Take a look at that. Okay? Now, with that in mind, take a look at the outline that um, I've just given you of the pre-Socratic philosophers, those prior to Socrates. Uh, you notice I've grouped them, where the principal grouping is in terms, you notice, of various kinds of monism under Romans 1, 2, and 3, as against pluralism. That is to say, the question as to whether there is one basic element that accounts for everything, or whether there are many basic elements. That would be, obviously, a kind of qualitative monism or pluralism, as the case may be. Qualitative. Is the one basic element or the many basic elements? But uh, it also involves a quantitative question um, whether the, the universe is numerically one all-inclusive, solid kind of sphere or whether there are numerically many distinguishable things. Now that sounds abstruse for the simple reason that you think you're something different than I am, which implies there are many different things. So with a quantitative monism are going to, is, is going to arise some uh, very fundamental question about the reliability of our sense experience. Uh, because if sense experience tells us we are many in number, but the theory becomes that everything is one in number, there's something wrong either with the theory that everything is one or else something wrong with our sense experience. So um, that will arise later on when we get down to the group labeled Eleatics, absolute monism, named Eleatics after Elia, which is in the toe of Italy, where some of these people were. So that quantitative issue arises there. But at the outset, we're dealing in that naive monism of the Milesians with a qualitative pluralism or qualitative monism. How many basic elements are there? Now, remember, they've never been in the chemistry lecture hall. They've never seen the table of the elements. And um, impressed as they are by the ordered um, arrangement of things, uh, the initial tendency is to look for one basic element. And as you read these materials, and I hope you will have read through the primary and secondary materials on the pre-Socratics by the end of this week, as you read these materials, uh, you'll find that Thales thought that everything was ultimately reducible to, derived from, the one element he called water. Now, for the moment, disregard the fact that you don't think it's an element, H2O. He wasn't to know that, poor Thales, you see. Uh, it still sounds like rather a wild hypothesis. Everything composed of water, well, wait a minute. Water is a remarkably adaptable kind of thing. It comes in liquid, solid, 
and vapour. It is essential to life, not only to your life and mine, but to uh, vegetation. Notice how brown everything is around here? We've had quite a drought this summer. I think I've mowed my front lawn once since early June, which um, is a welcome change, but it's a tragic one. You see. Uh, no, water is so fundamental to everything that goes on. That necessity. Though so understandably, Thales conjectured that maybe this is the basic stuff. Well, um, he um, wasn't the only person in the business. And you notice the name of Anaximander who, because he recognized that you have not only wetness, you have only dryness, you have also dryness, he began to see you have opposing qualities. And the same in other regards. Heat and cold. Light and dark. Male and female. And inasmuch as if you have opposing properties, no one can be more basic than the other, he supposed that the basic element must be something that is undefinable, and that's what the word apiron means. It cannot be defined. It cannot be delineated, marked off. The Greek word peras means a border, a demarcation line. The alpha privative makes it negative. So a pyron, it has no definition. It's undefinable. You see. And Eximenes, on the other hand, thought that air was the basic essential. And so you begin to get this variety. And what's surfacing, if you're familiar with Greek literature, what's surfacing is um, the fact that they are playing with the various elements that the Greeks um, talked about um, even in their literature. Earth, air, fire, and water. Those are the four classic Greek elements. Some have suggested that they represent the four necessities of life. Earth, food, air, breath, fire, warmth, water, something to drink, nourishes. Earth, air, fire, and water, four necessities of life. But you notice that um, here we have uh, Anaximenes, here we have Thales, later on we'll find Heraclitus and some of the Stoics plugging in on fire. You see? In other words, in terms of the elements as they conceived them, the elements with which they were familiar, which one of these is most basic? Or is it none of these? As an examander supposed. Well, the Milesians were asking these rather simple questions. Uh, processes of change, they thought, could be explained in the case of air with condensation, which produces moisture. Yes, see. So there are all sorts of um, possibilities in these proposals. On the other hand, Pythagoras and Heraclitus. Incidentally, that's the Pythagoras you meet in mathematics. The mathematician that um, produced what becomes known as Pythagoras' theorem, that the square on the hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Remember that, Pythagoras? Okay. 
Pythagoras and Heraclitus seemingly um, uh, independently of each other. In the uh, late 6th century, that's to say the 4500, in the late 6th century, we're saying that there is um, to, uh, to nature, as it were, two sides, each of which is equally important. A double aspect theory. Now, uh, you, you can get um, perhaps a rough idea of what I mean by double aspect. If you consider the question about an object that's almost becoming rare in this culture, a saucer. You know, this is the age of mugs rather than delicate English china with teacups and saucers. But at least you know the, uh, the shape of a saucer. Is a saucer concave or convex? Yes. From one point of view, looking down on it from above, it's concave. From the other point of view, looking up at it as somebody carries it along, it's convex. Two aspects to it. So to say that a saucer is both concave and convex is to talk about the double aspect nature of the saucer. Okay. Now, what Pythagoras and Heraclitus are impressed with is that there are two aspects to everything in nature. On the one hand, everything seems to be in a process of change. On the other hand, there is order, what we call uniformity of nature, predictability. You see? Oh, yes, to, um, to think of that change, Heraclitus suggested that the basic element is like fire. You know, fire is always changing. Uh, have you noticed um, sitting around a fireplace in the winter, you get sort of mesmerized by the flickering flames that are always changing? You see? Um, it's almost hard to concentrate on reading philosophy around the fire uh, for that reason. Constant change. You see. Yet, on the other hand, this is an ordered universe. This regularity. You know how certain kinds of wood will burn, and when they're wet, how they won't. So you have both change and order. Change and order. And Pythagoras and Heraclitus, independently of each other, uh, tried to talk about precisely that. The way in which um, Heraclitus does it is to suggest that what we have is fire or some fiery vapor, heat rising, steam rising, everything rising and changing and flickering and burning down and so forth. Fire plus some sort of um, intelligible traceable order that he calls logos. Now you've run across that word before. Uh, that's the word that the Apostle John is going to use in the first line of his gospel. In the beginning was the word, he's in arche, in her logos. In the beginning the logos. You see. This is where it first begins to appear in Greek thought. And John later adapts a Greek conception in the light of Hebrew conceptions to his purposes. Watch it. Now, on the other hand, uh, Pythagoras, the mathematician, 
also talks of things changing, and um, the idea of fiery vapor is something he alludes to. But instead of talking of logos, what he talks about is a kind of mathematical order to things. A mathematical order to things. Um, so that uh, you can represent all sorts of different shapes numerically. You see. This is a mathematical kind of universe where you can trace out the mathematical order. This is why he was interested in uh, geometry. You see. So you have these two emphasizing that there is an orderedness to nature for all the processes of change. And, footnote, in anticipation of the theme next time, that means that amidst all of life's change, we should live a rationally ordered life. You see? The ethic arises from this. Well, Pythagoras and Heraclitus. Uh, on the other hand, when you get to the Eleatics, they want absolutely no pluralism, no discrimination of two aspects, no world of change. And Parmenides, in very forthright fashion, declares that change is illusory. Plurality is illusory. Physical motion is illusory. The senses are simply the way of illusion. If you want the way of truth, you have to think in abstraction from all of the senses. Think abstractly. And if you um, want to see more of what is meant by thinking abstractly, well, you can read the Parmenides selections in the Kaufman Anthology. But um, give attention to Zeno, because Zeno tried to make the case for this absolute monism by posing paradoxes. Change is a paradoxical, self-contradictory thing that couldn't occur. For instance, take for instance a hare that is chasing a tortoise. Does the hare ever catch the tortoise? No. Because, you see, here is the line along which the tortoise is moving. By the time it gets to there, the hare has gotten that far. By the time the tortoise gets there, the hare gets that far. By the time the tortoise gets there, the hare gets that far. And because the hare keeps advancing, the tortoise, because the tortoise keeps advancing, the hare never catches the tortoise. You say he's already eating it. And that's illusory. You see. Um, does um, a chicken ever cross the street? No. Because if uh, this much is the street, then first the chicken halves the distance, H-A-L-V-E-S, halves the distance. Then the chicken halves the remaining distance. Then it halves the remaining distance, then it halves the remaining distance, then the remaining, then the remaining, then it never gets across the street. You see? Um, millet seeds uh, were regarded as the smallest seeds that there are. Millet seeds. Now, um, to show the paradoxical nature of pluralism, Zeno poses this. How much sound would one millet seed make if you drop it? No sound. All right, drop a sack 
of 10,000 millet seeds. How much sound will it make? Zero times 10,000, which is zilch. No sound. But you heard the third illusion. Rationally, it's impossible. The way of illusion is the way of the senses. The plural plurality of things that we see are illusory as plurality. Processes of change and motion are illusory. From a strictly logical standpoint, there can be no change, no plurality. Now, I don't think that there are has ever developed a school of thought known as Zenoism or Parmenideism uh, because um, th those people represent a sort of a logical terminus that um, nobody wants to follow them to. It's one thing to say that the senses are sometimes illusory it's one thing to say that sense perception is relative and changing. Sure, and we'll find lots of people, Plato and so on and so forth, say that. But to say that they are completely illusory, well, um, if you say that, why would you say it? To whom would you say it? And why utter any sound in saying it? if that position is correct. Why even record what Zeno and Parmenides said, if that position is correct? It's self-defeating. Yes, But the point is, um, not the position that they came up with, but the kinds of issues they're posing. Yes, what does it mean to say that everything is one whole? that this is a universe. Well, presumably it doesn't mean what Parmenides thought it meant. But on the other hand, is this a world of radical pluralism with everything disassociated? Radical individualism in an anarchistic kind of cosmos with no law and order? You see? In effect, what the pre-Socratics did for us was to pose the issues. And very often it's far more important what question surfaces than what answers surface. You see? It certainly is with these people. Well, when you get to the pluralists, you might say, um, this is a breath of fresh air. Uh, because here you have people, Empedocles, Anaxagoras, Democritus, who see a multitude of different things. Empedocles, in fact, picks up on all four. Earth, air, fire, and water. All four elements. And in order to explain the um, kind of uh, process that's involved, he comes up with some sort of a cyclical view of cosmic history. You see, seeing things going that way with integration and disintegration um, of the elements all the way through the history of the cosmos. But the four basic elements. Anaxagoras, on the other hand, thinks there must be um, a basic elements of every kind of qualitative thing, no matter how different. He calls them seeds. So um, your body will have seeds of bone, seeds of skin, seeds of flesh, Seeds of blood, seeds of muscle, seeds of hair, so on, so forth. 
And uh, there are some suggestions that it might be um, seeds of dark hair or seeds of light hair, seeds of curly hair or seeds of straight hair. Where are you going to stop this sort of pluralism? But then, having postulated such an infinite diversity of different things, all of these seeds, how are you going to account for the ordered unity of the human body, and for that matter, of the universe? And so what Anaxagoras does is to talk about um, what he calls noose or mind, as if there is some cosmic mind drawing things into ordered unity in an ordered direction, some sort of divine noose. Uh, you can see that uh, in groping for the source of cosmic order, they're groping towards some concept of a supreme being, you see. The beginnings of theology in the ancient Greeks, in distinction from some of their mythology, you see. But on the other hand, when you get to Democritus, the picture is different. Because while Empedocles and Anaxagoras were qualitative pluralists, okay, qualitative pluralists, Democritus is a qualitative monist. Everything is of one and the same quality. But a quantitative pluralist. That is to say, physical things are composed of infinitesimal atoms. An atom, the word literally means it cannot be split. It cannot be cut. An indivisible pellet of matter. Okay. So physical things that we know are composed of of vast numbers of atoms, indivisible pellets. And the qualitative differences between cats and cabbages and cauliflowers and kings, you see, the qualitative differences are due to the combinations of atoms producing those qualitative differences. Different combinations for a king than a cauliflower. Now, the idea is that the atoms come in different shapes and whirling around in some sort of cosmic vortex, natural kind of motion, whirling around in this cosmic vortex, collide, hook onto each other, combine so larger aggregates form. And there is a result of sheer chance mechanical processes. The whole body of things in heaven and earth has been formed over the course of history. So what you get then in um, these last people is particularly interesting because whereas um, an exaggerous is suggesting a teleological explanation. A teleological explanation. That is to say, there is this cosmic mind that orders things in these intelligible ways. Okay. On the other hand, Democritus has a purely mechanistic explanation has a purely mechanistic explanation. Blind forces combining by chance to produce the kinds of conglomerates 
that make up the cosmos. It's as if um, somebody took a whole bundle and bundles and bundles of individual letters and whirled them round long enough and out came the Sunday edition of the Chicago Tribune. You see, that sort of explanation, the sheer chance. But um, obviously, um, here you have two philosophers heading, heading in vastly different directions. You see? A mechanistic kind of materialism in which nothing exists but material atoms being moved by chance forces. Okay? And on the other hand, a teleological explanation, which is pushing in the direction of either some kind of theistic metaphysic or some kind of idealism, but some explanation which sees some immaterial reality of a rational sort, uh, accounting for the orderedness of the cosmos. Now, that's been a quick rundown. And um, before I pick up and pull some threads together, let me pause. Did you get the story? What do you want to get clear again? Ruth? Um, you were saying that Democritus is a qualitative monist, but a quantitative qualitative. Yes, because all of the atoms individual atoms are qualitatively the same, qualitatively alike. So a qualitative monist, but a quantitative pluralist. Many of them, but all of them qualitatively alike. Yeah, does that make sense? Um, getting the terminology under your belt and as part of your active vocabulary is part of the uh, part of the task at this juncture. Yes, um, I was having a question on Empedocles. Who? The first one, oh, Empedocles. Empedocles. Okay. Um, you say his, uh, his model is mechanistic. Um, I, I'm inclined to say no. I think he's groping towards a teleological view for this reason that in that cyclical picture of the elements combining and disassociating, um, he ascribes that cyclical process to uh, two forces that he calls love and hate. Attraction, repulsion. Now, depending how you take those terms love and hate, they could be simply metaphorical terms for attraction and repulsion as we think of it in magnetism and electricity. You see. In which case it would be a mechanistic thing. But on the other hand, if you take love and hate to be some inner directedness because of natural affinity, you see, um, it doesn't have to be conscious any more than a daffodil growing up in the spring or turning to the light implies consciousness, you see. But as long as there is, is an order that is end-oriented, then you could say this is the beginning of a teleology. So I'm inclined to say that Empedocles isn't out into the clear yet, one way or the other. But I think he's edging towards the, um, the teleological view. Yeah. Okay, um, now I, I want you to, uh, to get this general structure of the pre-Socratic period uh, down as um, well as you can. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, just today and next time. But we'll be referring back to it again and again. It'll become point of reference. Okay, so keep in mind the Milesians... Okay, qualitative monists of a rather simplistic sort, the Milesians, the double aspect theories of Pythagoras and Heraclitus, the Eleatics, their absolute monism, 
the pluralists who pose the mechanism versus teleology question. And the reading that you're doing will put the flesh on these bones. The structure is important. Now, what, um, what I want to, uh, to underscore is um, the kind of question that these people are raising. Um, we, we think of um, Thales as about 600 B.C. Okay, Thales about 600 B.C. By the time we get down to uh, Socrates, we're about 400 B.C. So we've got essentially a 200-year span in which the pre-Socratics are at work. 200-year span. Uh, in which, in effect, they are formulating the philosophical agenda that Western philosophy has worked with ever since. They are formulating a philosophical agenda that Western philosophy has worked with ever since. Now, maybe you're inclined to ask, well, why should we take their agenda? Well, the thing is that it is so interwoven into Western thought patterns in every discipline, not just in philosophy, in every discipline, for the simple reason that the later sciences emerged as spin-offs from philosophy, you see. Have you noticed how your science professors have Doctor of Philosophy degrees? And many of them never saw the inside of a philosophy classroom, except for people like Dr. Chapel here, who audits philosophy courses. Bless her heart. You see? Uh, simply because um, natural philosophy, so-called, philosophy of nature, natural philosophy, the sort of thing that these guys are doing is the seedbed out of which the empirical and mathematical sciences develop subsequently. You see. If you um, take Dr. Spradley's courses in the history of science, you'll find that the history of science up through or oh, approximately the Renaissance is essentially one strain of uh, what we do in the history of philosophy. You see. And then you begin to get the development of astronomy and physics independently of philosophy, later of chemistry and of biology. Sociology doesn't begin until the mid-19th mid century. Psychology as a science, not until early 20th century, as late as 1910. What's now the Journal of Philosophy was called the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, Scientific Method, etc. I know that's a mouthful, but uh, that's the way it was. Uh, so um, the agenda that is created, you see, by the pre-Socratics was um, carried on in natural philosophy in ancient and medieval times and transmitted into modern times. So that in a sense, the question we're asking is still, um, what are the basic elements, or if not basic elements, what's the basic stuff? Yes, Whether you want protons or quirks, take your choice. We're still asking the same kinds of questions. And how do you describe the causal processes and the causal forces at work that produce change? You see? Same type of questions. Well, what is that agenda? What is that agenda? And I, I think you can see um, pretty clearly that it's the kind of agenda that um, you should have been introduced to, more or less, in your introductory course, where um, we usually try to get questions 
in what we call metaphysics, whether or not they're labeled that way, questions in metaphysics having to do with the nature of reality. Whether it be questions about the natural world, mechanism and teleology, or questions about um, whether matter is real in itself or not, as George Berkeley thought. You see? Whether mind and matter are two different kinds of substance, as in the mind-body problem in talking of the nature of persons. Whether everything that occurs is due to causal processes in a deterministic scheme, or whether there's such a thing as free will. Whether there is an ultimate source of cosmic order, whether in fact God exists. Now, those are metaphysical questions. And you can see that that is part of the agenda then posed by the pre-Socratics. Now I've also suggested that um, secondly, there is a uh, further agenda under the surface in epistemology, theory of knowledge. Where you find there are some of these ancients who are thoroughgoing empiricists saying all that we know comes from sense experience. And indeed Thales seems to talk like that. Um, certainly the pluralists do, though they do have occasional speculation beyond that. They're basically empiricists. As distinct from rationalists like Parmenides and Zeno, who disparage completely sense experience and say that only abstract logical thought really um, uh, gives us reliable knowledge. Yes. And so epistemological questions are posed about how we know just how reliable is experience, just to what extent can abstract rational thought provide knowledge, how are these two related, you see, that agenda. Thirdly, there is an agenda about ethics and about society, if you like, social philosophy. Because as I hinted, both, uh, pa both uh, Pythagoras and Heraclitus maintain that if this is a rationally ordered universe, then we should live rationally ordered lives if we want to fit into the universe. We want to find our place, you see. And even Democritus suggests that a life guided by reason is of value in a mechanistic, materialistic universe. How come? Well, these blind forces cause pleasure and pain. So if you gain enough understanding of the causal processes and guide your life by what you know of the causal processes, you can then minimize the pain and pursue the pleasure. But that takes a rationally guided life. So out of these positions flow ethical positions. What is the good life? And what do we have to do to pursue it? You see. So the, this um, whole agenda of Western philosophy then uh, seems to be implied, um, spelled out at least in its basic terms uh, by these pre-Socratics.